Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Usually we have really beautiful guitar music to introduce these things, and for some reason we couldn't get the feed to work for Jeff's guitar. So Jeff, I'm glad you can sit there at least for tonight. <laughs> Thank you for coming out on a beautiful, uh, springy feeling night. I picked up our speaker tonight and she said, I don't know why everyone is complaining about all of the weather. Exactly. You people are weak. Yeah. <laughs> it's really not that It's bad. always good to get the audience on your side before you see. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Out of curiosity, how many of you have never been to one of these events uh, before, Faith and Life Lecture Series? Wow. Wonderful. Well, welcome to all of you. Uh, we're thrilled that you are here. Um, those of you who have been around for the 11 years of the series know that we have um, intentionally invited all kinds of different uh, Christians from all kinds of different walks of life to speak at these. We've had doctors, we've had lawyers, we've had journalists and authors. Um, our speaker tonight is actually unusual in, in the fact that she is one of the few speakers we have had who actually talks about God professionally. We've had very few theologians <laughs> and pastors. So she's one of the handful that we have um, invited and we're thrilled she's here. Uh, you can read her bio in the uh, program for tonight. I always like to add a couple of facts you may not know about our speakers. So I was chatting with her in the car. She tells me that she flirted with John F. Kennedy Jr. <laughs> when she was a waitress in New York. She is, I will also tell you, she is still grieving a bit because she got in early enough today to have pizza at Pizzeria Lola, right? Yum. And intentionally ate half of the pizza, saving the other half for later, but unfortunately she left the second half on top of her friend's car. <laughs> She also told me that she can clean and jerk 150 pounds. Will you join me in welcoming Nadia Boltz Weber? Uh, hi, um, so I have laryngitis. Um, it's a lot better today than it was yesterday. Yesterday I literally couldn't speak at all, so I'm gonna do my best, um, but you'll have to have patience with the fact that my voice isn't so strong. Um, so yesterday I realized that uh, two things about this, um, this talk, uh, the title of which is Faith and Imperfection, Being a Broken Gospel People in a World Demanding Excellence. Number one, that's a great title for a talk. <laughs> Number two, that's the title for a talk I've never given and can't just make up on the airplane tomorrow. <laughs> so, um, and it reminded me of last spring, I was at the Festival of Homiletics. Was anyone there? It's like a preaching conference thing. And has anyone ever gone to the Festival of Homiletics? Raise your hand. Okay, it's like this national preaching conference. And um, the funny thing is on the postcard, they had, I think, eight of our like headshots, right? It's like this full color postcard. And it had like Walter Brueggemann and Barbara Brown Taylor and Brian McLaren and Phyllis Tickle and Will Willimon and all these very seasoned people who've spent like decades building their career and they all have gray hair. And they have these very serious headshots. And then me. <laughs> and my friends, when they got it in the mail, texted me and they were like, did you photobomb the postcard? <laughs> for the Festival of Homiletics. I'm like, I was invited. Um, so anyway, it reminded me when I realized I have not given this talk before. <laughs> and I um, didn't, you know, because I'm a full-time parish pastor, didn't have time to sort of make a fancy PowerPoint or something. Um, it reminded me of the Festival of Homiletics this year where I preached and then I also was giving a lecture. And so it's like, I don't know, 800 preachers. And so I really focused on my sermon, because in a lot of ways, I, my, one of my sort of really primary identities is that I'm a preacher. And so I just really worked a lot on the sermon. And I didn't really think about the lecture. And I thought, oh, you know, I kind of, I have an idea of what I want to talk about. And I went in early, because I went two years ago, and I flew in and did my lecture and left. And I regretted it, because I wanted to see some of the talks. So I went in early, and I saw the lectures, and I heard like Craig Barnes, and 
um, Lily and Daniel and um, my friend Lauren Winter, and just like these genius people. And I went and listened to all their lectures. Now, that was a huge mistake because mine was like at the end, and they all had like, I don't, they just had like points to them and stuff. Like they, <laughs> <laughs> and they had like numbered points, you know, so they would be like number three, and all the pastors would like start writing notes, you know. And mine didn't have that at all. And, um, and then they, a couple of them talked about things that I was thinking I would talk about, and then I felt like people would either be bored by the repetition or think that I just stole their idea. <laughs> and so I was completely freaked out, and I kept thinking, it'll come to me, it'll come to me. I was in the hotel in the, in the Marriott or wherever I was staying, and I, was just, I spent like two hours looking at a blank screen, and my anxiety was getting higher and higher and higher. And, um, and then I was, it was like an hour and a half before I had to meet people for dinner, and my lecture was in the morning. Right? And I don't function really at night, so I knew I couldn't do it after dinner. So I, I, I was just like a wreck. So I'm in the lobby of the Marriott, and, um, and you know, it's all these mainline Protestant pastors, and I'm kind of easy to pick out of a crowd, and so I was like in the <laughs> lobby. And so if people know who I am, they, they recognize that's who I am. And so this guy came up to me, and he goes, hey, you know, I don't want to bother you. I'm sure you're busy, but I just want to thank you, and I read your sermons, and I, you know, blah, blah, blah. blah. And I just looked up at him, and I said, do you have a minute for some questions? <laughs> and he goes, uh, okay. I go, can you sit down? And he's like, all right. And he sits down next to me. And I explain the fact that I don't have a lecture. And then, and that I was so freaked out because everyone else's were so good and they just seemed like professional. And then um, I looked at him and I was like, so you've heard all the lectures, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, and you're familiar with what I do. And he goes, yeah. And I go, what do you want me to talk about tomorrow? Because I <laughs> swear to God that's what I will do. <laughs> and <laughs> so he completely like, decided what my lecture was. And interestingly, he, he, said, uh, he said, you know, we were taught in seminary not to have too much of our, not to talk about ourselves much in the sermon because it's not about us, and we, the, the point isn't to draw attention to us or talk about ourselves. He said, but you have a lot of yourself in your sermons, and how do you do that? And I just looked at him, I said, oh, thank you. And I went up to my hotel room, and I just took the last two sermons I wrote, and I wrote all these notes about what was going on in my life, and, and um, the struggles I had, and the doubts I had, and the things I was trying to preach on but didn't work, and I just was as honest as possible, sort of, doing what I do, which is just like have no pride and tell people everything about myself. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and so I gave that, I, I went up and I started my lecture by telling them that, by like saying to them, I was freaked out, I'm not Craig Barnes, I don't have any points. And then somebody, and so I said, look, I might just, to make myself feel better, occasionally during my talk say, number four. <laughs> <laughs> and just, <laughs> It's, and so they, um, but there is a point to me telling you the story, which is that um, you know it's it's nerve wracking to to be somebody who's only been in the field for a few years, and I'm like lecturing at the Festival of Homiletics to 800 pastors who have a lot more experience than I do, and how would I possibly have the authority to do that? And like if I came, if I came up and tried to be Craig Barnes and give this like brilliant academic lecture that had like numbered points, I, I, it just would have been a flop. But the fact that I was willing to um, admit my sort of neuroses about stuff, I mean just to be honest, they, they sort of resonated with that and they allowed me to have authority to speak to them. So, the funny thing is I haven't totally learned that um, completely because just today, I, like on the plane, I was actually trying to put a PowerPoint together. I was like, <laughs> oh, because I had these scriptures and I had this stuff and it was just, it, and I don't know how to do that well and I just again had to remind myself that like who we are is, I mean it sounds so new agey and like self-helpy but like who we are is enough, <laughs> you know, like when we come with the wholeness of who we are and we're willing in, in this way to hold the, the sort of awesomeness and the brokenness together, that's enough and people end up resonating with that in a way that sometimes they don't resonate with shiny professional stuff. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay, so here's my um, standard um, disclaimer. So um, I don't 
try to be somebody else. I mean, occasionally I think it would be better, and then I remember it's not. So I, um, <laughs> I am, so my promise to you is that I am just really gonna be me, and um, what that involves, if you've read my book, is that um, you might hear some swear words tonight because that's just how I talk. That's literally just how the people in my cultural context communicate, so I don't sort of curate a version of myself that I think you might approve of. Um, and, and, and I totally give you permission to do the same, that you can bring who you are, um, but the thing is, is you don't have a microphone. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, that's the difference. So, um, I always like to say that like some people don't think clergy should swear, I don't think clergy should try to pretend to be people they're not. So, um, so, um, the other disclaimer is that I don't give really linear lectures. I just kind of talk about this thing and this thing and this thing and they're sort of loosely related. Um, as a way of getting to having a conversation. So I'm just gonna talk about a bunch of stuff and then what I really love is Q&A. So um, I'm just gonna throw a bunch of stuff out there and then you guys can kind of can, uh, start a conversation back and forth if that sounds good. Um, it, the, reason, uh, the reason I end up talking a lot about my church is that I feel like people have asked me, do you know what the term reverse engineering is? Reverse engineering is this process, like when, uh, when the iPhone came out, Samsung have immediately had people reverse engineering it, meaning here's a product that works in some way, um, and we didn't build it, and we're curious, we have a curiosity about it, so we're gonna break it down to its composite parts to understand how it works and why it works. So I feel like people are often asked, like, I didn't, I didn't have this planning step by step and all this intention and, and a sort of five year plan around my church at all. Um, and so when people are curious about what it is, then I have to reverse engineer my own community to try and figure out what to say. Uh, but I think that process might be really helpful for churches in general, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, one of the sort of, and, and all I have the authority to speak to is this church that I serve in Denver. I've never been in a traditional congregation that was, that was dwindling in numbers and tried to figure out what do we do to make that stop? How do we stop the hemorrhaging? Or how do we get young people to come? Or a lot of the questions that people have in churches right now, I've never faced those personally. I have no authority to speak to that. that all I can do is tell you stories but that's what we're wired for. We think what we want are experts to tell us what to do, but what we're really wired for is narrative. And so I'm just gonna tell you stories about the community and a little bit of reasoning behind it and a, a, a couple of my kind of snotty opinions. And then you just do with that what you will. And if there's something that you hear tonight and you find yourself kind of just getting defensive about it, just know I'm not talking about your church, I'm talking about the person next to you's church. It's not. <laughs> It's totally not you. I, I think you're awesome. <laughs> okay. So House for All Sinners and Saints is what we call anti-excellence pro-participation. Um, and if you ever visit, you will totally get what I mean. <laughs> who, who here has visited? A few people. Yeah, it's kind of lumpy and homespun and um, and awkward, <laughs> but um, beautiful, right? I mean, it's incredible. So um, the reason we're anti-excellence pro-participation is because um, we're much more interested, we, we aren't, we really, we don't really actually do things very well, but we just do them together. So it's much more important, people's participation is more important to us than things being done really well. And so what's happened is we have an extraordinary level of participation in our community. We definitely defy that statistic that's like, what, 5% of the people do 85% of the work? Not, not at House for All Sinners and Saints. It functions like a co-op. <laughs> Less body odor, but it does. <laughs> so, um, so I'm gonna give you some examples of what that looks like, okay? So, um, but first you have to understand that um, there's only, there's like, we have about 200 people on a Sunday, and of those 200 people, there might be 15 who are Lutheran. 
And of those 15, probably 13 came from the LCMS. Um, so there's only a few people who were raised ELCA in our congregation, interestingly enough. There might be four, four or five. Uh, everyone's like, ooh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we have, we have a lot more post-evangelicals than we have Lutherans. Um, we have a lot of people who've never experienced liturgy before. We have a lot of people who've never been a part of church before. People who never, who were burned by religion, never in a million years thought they would be back and just find themselves there week after week after week. So these are also people who have a built-in suspicion of institutions, and they have, which is a whole nother lecture that I'm not gonna give right now. But, um, but they also have a built-in suspicion of presumed authority. So in a typical worship space, the sort of, you know, the long, narrow thing, about, if you look at the space between the back of the wall and this wall, usually about a third of it is reserved for the two special people who get to stand up front. And, um, and if you have somebody who has this suspicion of institutions and presumed authority, you just kind of lost already, just from the way the, the room's configured. Um, the, just the way the room's configured can just feel like, hey, weird. And so we've democratized the space, so the altar table is quite literally and metaphorically at the center of our life together. So the, the table's in the middle and we're in the round around it. So what we've done is democratize the space. Um, the other thing we've done is we don't professionalize the music. The, the music's a cappella. So we don't have somebody who's like, we don't have like these gr this great organ player, this great band, or this these great light show, or whatever. We just have human bodies. That's, all we have. And so all of the music that you hear comes out of the bodies of the people who showed up. And um, we have, we have um, a cantor who's amazing, who leads the singing, and a choral guild. So people who come like 40 minutes before the liturgy, and they, they um, with the cantor, they learn the parts. So that, and then they sit among the community to help hold the singing. We don't like remove all the good singers from the congregation and <laughs> seat them somewhere else. I have always found fascinating. <laughs> um, so, so we actually sometimes will announce, look, like if you're not used to singing in public or like if you feel like you have a really bad voice, if you, if you don't feel like you can sing well, at least sing loud. Um, <laughs> please, please make up for quality with quantity if possible. <laughs> um, but the fact that everyone's singing allows people who aren't used to singing or feel weird about their voice permission to also sing. That's really a metaphor for a lot of stuff in the church. The other thing is that um, the booklets in our liturgy, um, oh, I, was, I just want to describe the first time I <coughs> that I went to a Lutheran church. <coughs> I don't talk about it in the book, but I did go to one Lutheran church in Denver once that will be unnamed. And they, um, <laughs> And here I am, I've never been in a liturgical church at all. And I, they give me, they hand me, they're very friendly, they hand me a bulletin, and so there's the bulletin, and then there's like a celebrate insert, so like one of the prayers is on the insert, and then the readings are on the insert, and then the bulletin has like, um, like code. So there's, um, there's two books in front of me, different books. And then there's like a word I've never heard of, like sanctus, and then there's um, dot, 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 E, L, W, four, two. The hell? I have one. <laughs> and then another code, you know, another word with different letters and numbers. Oh, and then the, the smaller numbers are at the bottom of the right page, and the, like the bigger numbers the, are at the top and the back. Oh my God, it's like somebody stood there whispering in my ear, you don't belong here. <laughs> So um, we, we put all the music in the booklet. I mean, I, all the music, everything's in there. It's very clear, start to finish. You can show up without knowing what's going on and be able to follow it. We also always print the music. <clears throat> because We don't musically infantilize people by just giving them the lyrics because, you know, people just don't, they don't read music now. Like, I don't read music, but I know if the note goes up, you sing up, right? I mean, it's just... <laughs> And like if there's a dot after it, it's longer, and a squiggle means you just hold on for a sec. Like it's just, I feel like that's all you need to know because what happens 
it, when I go to churches that only have the lyrics and everyone else just somehow through some hive mind knows the tune, I'm like, I'm clearly not part of the hive mind, you know? At least if, the, if I can see where the note goes, I have like a fighting chance of participating. So we print the, so do you see what I mean by snotty opinions? You get it now. Um, <laughs> So we print the music. Okay, so when people come in, there's a basket of um, booklets, but then there's 15 or 18 different booklets that are, that are um, out there, and there's a sign that says, we're anti-excellence pro-participation. Please consider taking one of the leader leadership books. And so at the top is written things like um, the uh, introducing the confession and the prayer of the day and the first reading and the gospel reading. and. Um, and the assisting minister at the Eucharist, and Eucharistic minister, and post-communion prayer, and benediction, and it's all up for grabs. Actually, the word liturgy means the work of the people, and so we take that as seriously as, as we can. Now, there are certain things I do as the pastor, but there's just a couple of them that have to be me, and so um, what happens is from within the community, people stand up, and they lead that part of the liturgy. They participate. I mean, even the liturgy is, is led by just the people who show up. Here's what you get, and here's what you give up. What you get are things like, an, like when I stand up to go to the altar, I have no idea. It's like a game show. I'm like, who's gonna stand up and join me? I don't know who took the book, you know? So I come up here, and I'm like, who's, who's it gonna be? And like, what you get is like an eight-year-old boy who goes, I wanna do it this week. You get that, you get somebody who, um, who ends up crying the whole time because they're, they're getting to say these sort of holy words and do these holy things. Um, you get things like that. What you give up is predictability and control. <laughs> so you gotta just kind of go with it. There's, um, there's, no, there's no anxiety at house. Was any, Nick, you were just there. What, did anything go wrong? Was something weird and like was floppy and didn't happen well? Do you remember? Oh yeah, I presided at the Eucharist holding a seven week old because I didn't want to put her down. Um, <laughs> but you know why? Is because, the reason is because like, we, we just started doing two, see I just taught, I'm just gonna, I just like, my notes, I, nothing, I've said two things on here, so I'm just gonna talk. <laughs> so what, uh, what happened was we, so we just organized as a congregation, which I'll talk about if you're interested. But uh, I have some things to say about the model constitution if you're interested. But, um, and so, and we just went to two services and we just, you know, called uh, or, or high, uh, appointed another pastor for a while. So just lots of changes. And, um, and so we had this congregational meeting to sort of vote in our new council, which we call the housekeepers. And it was the first time we did that. And they were, you know, we put out the nominations, all this stuff. It, told people who the nominating committee were, if you have any issues, let us know, you know, all this stuff. And so between services, we had the, the congregational meeting and somebody um, sort of brought up this really negative thing that they could have talked to me about instead of just, uh, that, that spreading negativity thing, I have no patience for. There's a reason, you know, Paul was a church planter and there's a reason why he was like, cut that shit out all the time in his letters. Do you know what I mean? So. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, um, so it just, I got really mad, like I got upset, I was, like I dealt with it well in the, in the moment, and, and that person was heard, do you want to make a movement? No. Okay, it's noted, and we went on. But it, I didn't feel like it was necessary, and I resented it, and uh, I resent that kind of negativity being brought by someone in, my, in uh, our community. So then I had to lead the next liturgy. And I, I, it's hard for me, I mean, I go from zero to batshit crazy really fast, you know, and it's really <laughs> hard for me to like go back and really fast. And so I just was in a bad space and I hate trying to lead liturgy in a bad space. And I looked around right before the liturgy started because I knew I was not in a good place. And, um, and I was trying to find someone. I saw Melissa who's, who's very pregnant. I had just done this like henna tattoo on her belly earlier in the week. She's lovely. She was raised Pentecostal. She's like a little hipster mama. Anyway, she, um, I said, I looked at her, I said, can I borrow you for a minute? She said, yeah, and we, 
we went in, I took her into the hallway and I said, I'm in just this really bad space. Would you pray for me so I could like start the liturgy? And she said this really beautiful prayer for me. So I got through the liturgy and I looked up and there was this couple who, who had come in with seven week old twins. We hadn't seen them for a few months. They'd only been at house four or five times and before the babies came. And then we hadn't seen them for a while. It was the first time we saw them. And um, they have like a 13 and a 16 year old. And I think she thought she was, because she's got to be my age. And I think she thought she was menopausal. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, twins. <laughs> um, so I went over, because I love babies, and I just held this seven week old. And it was like this like oxytocin <laughs> in my brain or something. And so I just ended up presiding at the whole, the whole Eucharist with this baby. Anyway, um, so when things go wrong or somebody for, doesn't get up to lead the thing or they say words wrong, like we, we have a catechumenate and someone called it the catechumenate in the, in, the, um, in the announcements. So now we call it the catechumenate. It sounds like this like Spanish dance or something. There's like no anxiety, right? I mean, just none. It's, we think it's hilarious that things don't go wrong in our church. So there's no anxiety. Um, uh, the jobs, where was I going with that? So there's this thing about, um, I think people's voices matter and creating ways for them to be present in a lot of different ways I think matters in our church. So I have a theory that I think that the reason that people are so active and involved in providing leadership in the rest of the community's life together is because they're immediately trusted with the holy things like we immediately, you could walk in off the street and read the gospel at our church or, or serve the Eucharist. So you're like, you're trusted with these holy things and I think that makes you feel like, oh wow, this is like, you know, a, a place where um, who I am and what I have to bring is welcome. So I think there's something corresponding there. There's, there's, a, there's an incredible amount of things going on in my church I know nothing about. Like, that I'm not involved in. I just hear of stuff all the time starting. People just start things and then they participate in them that don't need the pastor. And I think it has to do with the fact that the, when the pressure's off because the excellence thing doesn't matter, people are more likely to participate and the more likely they are to participate, the more likely they are to bring their gifts to the community. It's my theory, I don't know. Um, Another case I have for sort of embracing um, anti-excellence pro-participation is that I think it allows people to have a space where their imperfections and their brokenness are not something they have to feel shame about, that they can actually hold openly and not have to sort of hide. Because I think our brokenness and our imperfection are the spaces where we stand in the need of God in a way that we don't in our excellence. So if our churches are places that are concerned about doing things really well, I wonder if that doesn't create a space where people don't feel like the stuff that's not excellent about them is, a, is safe there. <clears throat> um, there's one, one um, we, in, you know, right after the sermons, normally the hymn of the day, right? <laughs> Please don't take that baby out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and the function of the hymn of the day is it allows the gathered people to respond to the gospel, right? So we took that out and replaced it with something that serves the same function. It's called open space. And it's a 10 minute time right after the sermon of prayer and response and reflection. And um, everything just slows down. Like just, it's just quiet prayer and meditation. People, during that time, there are a few different things that go on. People actually write the prayers of the people that are then spoken out loud later in the liturgy. You, you might find this fact interesting, a lot of people don't realize this. They aren't called the prayers of Augsburg Fortress. <laughs> um, I know, I didn't realize that either. I just, I saw it on PBS and... Um, <laughs> they're called the prayers of the people. Um, and so we basically say to people, what is it that you, in this moment, in this sacred space, what do you want to say to God? 
about yourself or someone else or about the world. And then those are read out loud as the prayers of the people. Uh, two people voice them back and forth. Um, and I'm telling you, it is like the whole, you could change anything at House for All Sinners and Saints, but you could not change that. Because what you get is the truth about what people are going through. So if you're somebody who's entered that space and you're struggling with depression, and you hear someone say, God, I'm really struggling with my depression right now. Help me know that I'm, I'm worthy of being your child and of being loved. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm not the only one. When do you, I mean, if, or if you hear, or you get to celebrate things, or you get to laugh during the prayers of the people, or you get to say, oh yeah, you know what? I really, sh I should be, I should, I should add Syria to my prayers this week. Thanks for that reminder. Whatever, it's like, it, it, it just brings it all together in this really personal way. Like, it's it, this incredible intimacy and truth telling in, in the liturgy. Um, and sometimes our liturgies can be a little bit absent of intimacy and truth telling. So um, there's a way in which that can be done in a bigger congregation. You guys can't, you know, have a prayer station set up. I mean, there'd be these like long lines. We only have 100 people in each of our liturgies. But what I, I did this at the Festival of Homiletics during the um, sermon, the, the liturgy that I preached at, and I went to 12, 12 or 15 people before the liturgy and I handed them an index card and a pen. And I said, right after the sermon, would you be able to write a prayer, like whatever you want to say to God in that moment, and it could be anything. And then those were collected and read out loud. So you know, you could just designate different people each week to do that without changing your liturgies that much. And if you just, you know, um, it's too bad Lent already started because you know, God created the seasons in the church here so you can try shit without people freaking out. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> um, Oh, we're just doing this for Lent. They're like, okay. <laughs> or just try it for a month during the summer or whatever and just see what happens. How does, it, how does that space feel differently when people's brokenness is just so present in the space. It, I mean, it's like our need and the gospel is so clearly now wrapped together in that moment. Um, okay, so I have a bunch of notes that, about stuff that you probably are not going to care about. So I think what we're going to do, um, oh, I'm going to read a couple things. I have a practice. When I give a new lecture, I always post something on our, my, my church has, a, has its own little Facebook group that's just us. And um, and I tell them, this is the title of the lecture, this is what I'm lecturing on, and what do you want me to say? Because if I'm talking about them, I, their voices need to be in the room. And so I'm just gonna re read a couple of the responses. Um, it's, it like keeps me honest, because you know, I could make up anything. Um, <laughs> so one of them said, I'll never forget this image. Um, Dahlia spilled Jesus' blood on the floor for the first time she helped with communion and kept forgetting to say the blood of Christ shed for you. I had to keep whispering it in her ear each time someone partook of wine while staring at the wine-stained floor surrounding her feet. Here we have the faith of a child imperfectly involved in the Eucharist. Somebody else said, this, wrote this equation, excellence plus ego equals self-righteousness, but brokenness plus honesty equals grace. And then somebody else wrote, um, actually worked at a church where excellence in ministry was a core value, and then I came to house and it was like rolling off a pair of spanks that were way too small. <laughs> Q&A. Yeah, what time is it? So um, I really do prefer to do Q&A so, um, so it can be a little more conversational. Otherwise, we run the risk of me talking about stuff you guys just don't care about at all. So um, I'll talk about whatever you guys want, but first, I think some announcements. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's say thank you, first of all. Thank you. Yes. 
that's going to fall off. And can you flip that up? There you go. Yeah, thank you, Nadia. I'm coming that. back in a minute. You're what? <laughs> yeah, you're I'm coming, coming back. back you're not minute. going away. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, a few announcements. Uh, one is, I always like to let you know what our next event is going to be. And this is in your program tonight. Uh, but it is Thursday, April 24th with uh, Dr. Eben Alexander. Has anyone read his book? Any, oh, wow, quite a few of you. Okay. It, it, actually, last night we had Wednesday mid week Lenten worship, and someone came up to me after worship and said, you've got to hear about this new book. Um, and I said, oh yeah, he's coming in April. <laughs> so join us for that uh, Thursday, April 24th, 7 o'clock again here in the sanctuary. If you'd like updates about upcoming events, um, you can give us your email address on this form, or you can go to our website, uh, faith-and-life.org, or there's this new thing called Facebook, <clears throat> which you can also go to and like us there. And th those are all easy ways for us to communicate uh, upcoming events. Um, I will tell you as well, we're hard at work on next year's series. We always have five speakers, and we have four of them scheduled. We'll have uh, information about that coming out in the next couple of months, so stay tuned for that. I also always like to say a few thank yous at these events. You may have noticed that there was no ticket for you to come in tonight, that you had to pay no money to be here. Uh, from the very beginning of these events, uh, 11 years ago, we have always worked hard to make sure that they can be free and open to the public, and that is only possible thanks to the generosity of, of, of some wonderful people and organizations locally. So let me just say uh, thank you to some of those. These are again listed in your program. Uh, I'd like to thank Thrivent Financial for Lutherans, the uh, Community Crossroads Group, uh, Productivity Inc. And I don't know if representatives from all these organizations are here tonight, so I'm not going to call them out individually, but Productivity Inc., Cressa, uh, TCF Bank, Rapid Packaging, uh, Sparky Abrasives, Luther Seminary, Seminary the McLaurin Institute uh, at the University of Minnesota, Fuzzy Duck Design, and the Bookcase, which is uh, Minnesota's oldest independent bookseller and which always helps us with book sales. So thank you, people from the books, Bookcase out there. Uh, there are also a lot of individuals who contribute very generously. You are here thanks to all of those individuals and organizations. Would you please say thank you to them? Um, I will also say a special thank you tonight. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, how do you figure out who's going to come to speak at this thing? Um, there are all kinds of answers to that question. In the, instant, in, in the uh, case of this evening, it's thanks to two very specific people who happen to be standing in the corner of the sanctuary right now. You're all going to look now. It's Alan Nancy Tank, who are members here at St. Philip Deacon. I don't know when it was, Alan Nancy. Last year sometime, they came back. You had spoken at the National Youth Convention for the LCA, and they had a friend who went who was on fire about you, and they said, maybe we should have her come. <laughs> and I said, okay. So, Alan, Nancy, thank you for that, and you all can say thank you to them uh, later as well. Um, and then I guess the final thing I will point out is that uh, Nadia's book, um, which is a New York Times bestseller, is available for sale tonight. After the Q&A, we're going to hightail it out of here so that she can sit at a table. She's happy to inscribe books. Uh, she is struggling with her voice, as she mentioned, so she can't have long conversations. She has to give another talk tomorrow, but uh, find her out there if you'd like her to inscribe a book. Okay? All right, so we're going to do a little time for Q&A. Um, yeah. We'll see how long you want to go. Well, it won't go f all night, you know, we won't be here. <laughs> um, there's a microphone right there and a microphone right there. And um, go to it. Why am I a Lutheran? Oh. oh my gosh, there's a whole chapter in my book about that. Um, here's the short answer. Um, the Lutheran Church is the, is, is the only place I found that gave me language for what I'd already experienced to be true in my life. So when I, when I stumbled into a Lutheran church in my you know, mid-20s, I'd been sober a few years, when they said we're all simultaneously sinner and saint, I was like, oh my God, that explains so much, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, it, 
I, this is the God I'd experienced to be true, to be real. Um, and this sort of unwavering, fierce commitment to preaching the gospel and to grace. Everywhere else I feel like I hear grace plus. Um, but not the Lutherans. Yeah. Would you, would you say, say more? Oh, like out, out in the, in, uh, the community. What happens when people leave oh, yeah. worship? Yeah. Um, so I have a whole uh, lecture I give about, about being public church. And so we, um, <clears throat> and oh, here's another great sort of example of me getting something wrong, is that um, the first year housed, you know, it's really hard to start a church from scratch. I wouldn't recommend it. It's really hard to build up the dying institution of the church in the urban core amongst a heavily cynical population. Um, this is how I know God is real, is that it actually happened anyway, even though it felt impossible. But it was really hard, you know, and, and there just people aren't that church friendly, you know. It's, I mean, it's not a, as churched culture as it is here in Denver. And, um, and I thought, okay, what we'll do is we'll have these really quirky events out in the community. And I was really inspired by Mercy Seat here in Minneapolis and, and Church of the Apostles. And, and so we came up with, like, we, I started a theology pub and we had beer and hymns in the basement of a bar. We started right away. We, we did this thing called Fat Tuesday at the Thin Man. Thin Man is this bar in, in Denver. And so we did Fat Tuesday at the Thin Man. We handed out donuts all night in a bar with like these postcards that were addressed to Post Secret, where you write your secrets and mail them to this guy and he makes books out of them. And so, so people could confess their sins before Lent started. And then we did Blessing of the Bicycles. So a lot of that quirky stuff we still do to the, today, we did that in our first year. But I was a church planter, so I was doing like all the work. I was exhausting myself. Like my friend Ryan Marsh, who's a church planter in Washington at Church of the Beloved, someone asked him, what does it take to be a church planter? He's like, mostly a station wagon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what I thought was like, we would do all this stuff, and then people would see that we're not that, we aren't those kinds of Christians, like we're, we're fun and we're like irreverent and whatever. And like then they would come and be part of our worship community. And so I exhausted myself for a year doing these things. And then at the end of the year I reflected on it and I was like really tired. Actually, you know, a year after my ordination, I read all these notes that people wrote me at my ordination. It was like bound into a little book and I read them and I just sat there bawling because I felt like a failure and it was so hard and all of these hopes they had just seemed so far away because nothing was working and I hated all the people and it was just terrible. Anyway, so um, at the end of the, the year of doing these events, I reflected on it and I was like, okay, Zero people came as a result of these events. No people came to liturgy on Sunday as a re result of these events. And I felt like a failure. I was like, okay, I should just, I thought I could do this. I can't do this. It's too hard. I should give up. And then I thought, geez, well, that's ridiculous. Like, why is, it a, why is it a means to an end and not just an end, right? It was like, why, because the people, there were a ton of people in the community, the broader community, who participated in these things we did, Operation Turkey Sandwich and Blessing of the Bicycles, and loved it. And my, my church members participated and really got a lot out of it, and yet I was seeing it all as a failure because it, it failed to produce this thing that I thought it would. And then I thought, well, what if all of those things we're doing are an end in and of themselves and are not a means to an end? And then all of them went to being successes in my head instead of failures. Because a lot of times, like I spoke at Luther Seminary at some point about evangelism. And again, like I, I crowdsourced in my community on Facebook. I'm like, oh my God, they want me to talk. Do we do evangelism? And someone's like, we definitely don't do evangelism. I, they said, well, but I do like talk about about my church all the time to my friends and invite people and post stuff on Facebook, but like we don't do evangelism. <laughs> and, um, and the reason he said that is because evangelism's like code for one of two things, either coercively convincing someone to believe what we believe out of sort of fear, or um, it's code for church growth strategy. 
Um, now, if, if, if church growth is an issue for you, that's fine. Please don't call it evangelism. You know, if really what you need is to like recruit people because you are tired of serving on the committees and paying all the bills, <laughs> and you really think that they should have a turn at it, um, that's fine. That's totally not evangelism. <laughs> um, and so it was like I was guilty of this thing of being like, pre like pretending the stuff I was doing was one thing when really I had this other result in mind and then judging it according to that. So um, we do a lot in the community and we, honestly, at this point, it's built into the DNA of the church. We do it because we think it's fun. That's it. Literally, that, that's it. Like, and when we put out press releases, people are like, why are you doing this? We're like, we think it's awesome. So <laughs> we don't care, we're just like, I mean, it's, I think a lot of what we do as, the, as, our, as a church is really like to entertain ourselves. <laughs> like we just think it's hilarious, we think we're hilarious. So, uh, I don't know if she's next, but uh, I'm clergy as well, and I thank you for your honesty, especially I love the chapter on the cotton candy machine. I have, it wasn't an actual cotton candy machine that I have hauled around, but I've been there, done that, and that was uh, refreshing to hear that honesty. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, that chapter was really about what I'm talking about tonight, because at the end, you know, at the end of the chapter, I'm, it was one of the first times that I was flown somewhere to talk about the church, and I thought, I've got to give them some sort of impressive thing, and then instead, I was like, can I just tell you about my total failure at something, and then it ends up that's what they needed, yeah. was, I, I mean, a lot of times, I'm like, I don't know, I feel like the job of the pastor is like, I will just throw myself under the bus first. Fuck it, I'll go first, you know? So I'm just, I'm like, here, here's, here's what I'm like. And everyone's like, oh, thank God we're like that too, you know? <laughs> so. My question is, I haven't heard a lot about your family. And, you know, it's at your discretion what you share and you don't share about your family. But I know your husband's clergy and there are some kids. And um, how does all that family life, church life balance all of that work? Yeah, I, um, I get that question a lot. I, I don't talk about my family just to sort of a lot in particular because it, to protect their, um, you know, their privacy. Uh, I mean, I'm not like Angelina Jolie or anything. <laughs> I mean, you know, they didn't choose this. So, um, but I will say this, um, I am at home a lot. Like I'm actually really a homebody. So if I'm not on the road doing this, or at my gym, or at my church, I'm at home, or, or the coffee shop where I work. You know, I like do all my stuff, I don't have an office. I don't do, I mean, I see on Facebook that people do things, like I know that they go mountain biking, and go to festivals, and they go to concerts. I don't do it, I just go, I'm at home. So, um, but here's the reason I'm able to be at home uh, a lot. We don't have a committee system. So I, my time that really would be with my family is not unnecessarily taken up by committee work at church. That's why. Um, and I'll explain to you why. Is because, um, because uh, there's, there's like kind of like one type of personality that really loves serving on committees. I would never serve on a committee. It sounds like misery, no thank you, awful idea, right? So. Um, now, the type of personality that, that enjoys serving on committees is totally needed at church, right? So I'm not trying to discount that. I think it's a lousy idea if you have one type of personality doing all the work and making the decisions in your church. Like, what you're missing out on is like cultural creatives, young adults, I mean, there's, you know, I mean, there's, there are just types of people who won't serve in committees. So, what we do, once again, what I give up is predictability and control because of the way we do stuff, hold on. Um, a, a few weeks ago, we had a liturgy guild meeting to plan Ash Wednesday and the Sundays in Lent. So I made a Facebook event and sent it out, and um, there were 20 people who had voluntarily spent three hours of their Saturday planning Ash Wednesday and the Sundays in Lent. When I put that out there, I had no idea who was going to show up or if anybody was going to show up. Actually, three people who planned Ash Wednesday and Lent had never been to an Ash Wednesday service in their life. Right? You would never get those people on a worship committee, ever. But if you're like, hey, we trust you, we trust you 
to show up to this thing. We want you to show up to this thing, right? So what I give up is predictability and control, but what I get is people who've never been to an Ash Wednesday service participating in creating one. That's amazing. That's amazing, right? So, um, but I, I still have a role in the room. It's not, it's controlled chaos, right? So, um, cause you know what? Some people have really stupid ideas. <laughs> it's true. And a lot of times, maybe in this area of the country, the church tends to nice each other to death, so nobody will say that's a stupid idea, right? <laughs> I mean, not that you're gonna be unkind, but you're held hostage to somebody's really stupid idea because nobody wants to hurt their feelings or say anything. And so basically, everyone has to look at an ugly ass banner for the entire season of Lent. <laughs> the whole thing. You're, you're, you're aesthetically held hostage for an entire season as a community because no one would be like, that might not work in our space, or like too much glitter, whatever, right? <laughs> so, so figuring out a way to sort of um, make sure it's not going off the tr rails, right? I'm doing that the whole time, and the only reason, the only way that can work is if I can keep myself in check, meaning, um, here's an example. We had a liturgy guild meeting during Advent, and somebody for, for Advent, and the, there were a couple people who wanted. We we have a waiting room outside in this courtyard. We have a Spanish courtyard, and we create an Advent waiting room, and it's lit in all these Christmas lights. And everybody waits outside, and there's a sign on the door that says, "Please wait to be called." And so when we start, we ring a bell, and then we all sing a song at the same time and enter the space together. It's just a different way to enter. Because usually when you show up, people are laughing and eating popsicles and passing around babies. And, you know, I mean, then we're like, the Lord be with you. And everyone's like, oh, whoops, I got to on again. So, I mean, it's just a particular way of starting, right? So to set that season apart, we start differently. So we had, we had been singing Wait for the Lord, you know, the Taze thing, which really works, right? And then a couple people said, we should sing this, God's, this song from God's Bell, Prepare the Way of the Lord. And I thought, I don't think I could do that without rolling my eyes. Like, I just don't, I, it was hard for me to imagine. And I just thought, terrible idea. <clears throat> but what I had to do is have the discipline to take the temperature in the room and realize I might be the only one thinking that, right? So, like, if I think it's stupid, but, like, everyone else seems to be okay with it, sucks to be me. Right? <laughs> Too bad, Pastor Nadia. You don't get your way this time. So like, sort of holding that space and paying attention to the temperature of the room. I mean, it takes a very particular type of leadership to be able to, to run a church like that. But, um, so the reason we don't have, um, the reason I get to be home a lot is because we don't have, I'm not at church meetings. Because if I had gone to people and said, look, we need a committee of eight people to be on the worship committee, and it's an hour and a half on the second Tuesday of every month, and it's a two-year commitment, I would have zero people. But the way we did it, I had 20. Thank you. Oh, over, I'm sorry, I was neglecting this side. No. You're um. really important to me, this side. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. You did an interview with Krista Tippett, I believe, at the Wild Goose Festival, mm -hmm. and one of the concepts that you were talking about was the idea of God doesn't give up us individually more than you can handle, but yet it's yeah, a community yeah. that comes together right. in grace. Can yeah. you kind of talk yeah, about Yeah, my that? husband's from Texas, and he said that in the text it's actually y'all and not you. So it's like um, that God won't give you more than y'all can bear, right? Rather than God won't give me what I, because when you're in a place of going, this is more than I can bear, and somebody reads that scripture to you, don't you just want to smack them upside the head? <laughs> it's a horrible thing to do to someone. Um, and so I, I, you know, sometimes, like we, we talk about, like sometimes we're the ones who are lowering our friends through the roof to Christ, and sometimes we're the ones being lowered. And that, um, you know, faith really is not a, an individual sport. It's like this team event. And that um, I think really the book I'm writing now is about that, to tell you the truth. And um, 
it's really inconvenient, but we can't be Christian by ourselves. It doesn't work. It's not how it was meant to be. And so we have the messiness of other other sinner saints to deal with, you know. Um, I have to say there's, um, it's really lovely the way people in my congregation love each other. It's one of my favorite things to behold. They really do pray on each other's behalf very fervently. That's a big part of our Facebook group, is people posting things they need prayer for. But what's interesting is we don't tend to have the designated sick people and the designated like caregivery people who are healthy. It's, there's this culture of turn taking where the people who really do kind of have their stuff together more in an instant could be the ones with a need that could be met by the guy who's you know, off his meds, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know, and I can't tell you why that is really. I can't say I, that I created that. I think just the, having that space of real honesty where people really can bring their brokenness and there's no shame to that and people are just loved for it. Um, allows for that because there's not people sort of hiding behind a facade of, of I've got it all together at my church. So, Thank you. so the St. Paul Area Synod is looking for a bishop. I think you may know that. And uh, your name's come up. That's <laughs> hilarious. Let me tell you how I hear that. I and, hear that as, we'd and, like to give you the opportunity to have a life that you would be miserable in in exchange for a title. <laughs> well, uh, to be honest, your name did not come up in the context of being our bishop. Oh, thank God. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> it, no, I'm serious. There are clowns every single season who I get a call and they're like, your name's on the first ecclesial ballot for a synod. I'm like, and then when I stop laughing, I'm like, take my name off. So uh, the, your name did come up in the context of how does a bishop support you? Oh yeah, that's a really good question. You should ask my bishop because he is amazing at it. Okay. Um, Jim Gonia is my bishop. Anybody know Jim? Yeah. Um, he, now in all fairness, he wrote the recommendation for candidacy for me to begin with years ago, so he knows me really well. We're friends. Um, but now he's also my bishop. He has been for a year, I think. Um, man, it's amazing to, be, to have a bishop who um, texts me and goes, like, how's your soul? <laughs> like, how are you holding up? He actually said, he said, look, um, like, I see you and your congregation as a resource for the broader church. Therefore, your health and your congregation's health is something I'm really invested in because we, I want you to remain a resource. Um, so I don't want you to burn out. Um, and, you know, he checks in with me on a regular basis. Um, and I'll tell you what the ELCA does well, really well. Um, all of the congregations that are sort of similar to House in the ELCA, they were all, st all but one, I think, were started by people who were not ordained when we started these churches. Um, most of us also weren't raised Lutheran, interestingly enough. But the ELCA might not be great. The institution's not so good at starting these churches themselves. But what they're amazing at is recognizing something that's going on and saying, how can we support you? So um, I, I, I travel pretty broadly outside of the Lutheran church. I don't think another denomination does that nearly as well and nearly has the investment in new churches that the ELCA does. So our denomination is amazing at saying, hey, there's this like what they call, I hate the word, missional, I, just don't, I can't even make myself say it. But um, there's, <laughs> There are these sort of new communities that are emerging that are native to millennial culture and look different, um, and they, they, it happens differently there, but how can we support it? So I have to say that they're incredible at that. Here's what the ELCA did. They ensured I had a top-notch theological education, and then they trusted me with it. 
really important. I never had someone go question, question something I was doing, to tell you the truth. No one's like, you know, beer and hymns, we don't know that there might be a liability or what if you have it. Nobody did that. They, they understood that I was from a cultural context they didn't understand and where the ELCA had no presence and that I understood really well. And so they made sure I was a good theologian and then they trusted me in my own context. That's really important, really important. The other thing I would say that bishops could do is that they could make sure that um, folks like myself, church planters, or people who are doing things a little differently, are connected to other people a little farther down the line. Really important to do that. And they don't have to be in the same denomination, but I couldn't have done what I've done if I didn't have people like you know, uh, Kay Evenson and Mark Stenberg from Mercy Seat, um, or, you know, Ryan Marsh at Church of the Beloved, or different, some of my friends in the UK who have similar churches. If there weren't people who always picked up my call, right, because it's really hard work. So they need to really make sure that they have that good network of people who've been doing it a little bit longer. I think that's the way, that's the way we should be training mission developers. The way we train mission developers in the ELCA is, um, not the best idea, I think. I mean, I think, you know what would be great is to get the people who are new church planters together with a whole panel of 10 or 12 church planters that are like two years in, five years in, 10 years in, and they, they spend a whole afternoon saying, here's all the mistakes we made. Just, here's all the mistakes we made. Here's some things we were totally surprised by that worked. Right? Here's some best practices that took us a, a, a while to figure out. Here are some amazing stories. Right? That would prepare people in a way that having, you know, um, people, bureaucrats giving PowerPoint presentations about, oh my God, you know what I hate? Natural church development. Do you guys do this? <laughs> Anybody do this in the church? Natural church development. You can hire a church consultant. This is like, this is, my whole lecture is against natural church development. That's what it is. <laughs> no, listen, because you can spend all this money to get a consultant in, and they'll give you these different categories, like passionate spirituality and transformational worship, and they'll have two words to them, you know, um, groovy small groups or whatever, like they all, and then you get people from your church together, and they do a little survey, like, to figure out what, how good are we at each of these things, right? Okay, fair enough. And then what you do, the whole point, is to focus on the thing you suck at. <laughs> Who's going to be energized for that? <laughs> Look, we, we've decided what we suck at. Let's have a meeting and just talk about that the whole time, you know? And then we're going to have our whole year dedicated to the thing we suck at. And I'm like, well, the messages are interesting there because, oh, and then they'll show you an image of a, like, water barrel with the, like, that has the slats with the metal ring around it, and it'll say, your congregation can only hold as much water as the lowest thing in the water barrel, the lowest plank. And I'm like, wait a minute, whose value system is this that says that we have to get the plank all the way up on all the things? That sounds like corporate American values to me. That does not sound like gospel values to me, because if we suck at something, <laughs> Because if we suck at something, I bet the church down the, down the block is awesome at it. Why is it that we're judging ourselves, you know, according to our budgets and our buildings and our programming with a set of values that shouldn't have ever been ours to begin with? I mean, there's so many pastors out there that are so discouraged, and, and I feel like it's like they're saying, like, you know, my little business isn't running the way it should. So I, I think there's a way that we bought into American corporate values in a way we never had any business doing in the first place. So um, because, and when people are like, the church is dying, the church is dying, I'm like, wait a minute, when you say the church is dying, what do you actually mean by that? Do you mean like we aren't as great at being this like impressive institution that owns buildings and properties and has all this stuff going on with it? Is that what you mean? Because I don't know that that actually mean is the church because there are a lot of things that the culture does really well. The culture does daycare well and they do premarital counseling. I mean, there's all these things that the culture does that we don't necessarily have to replicate. The culture has buildings and you know, our society has places that people meet and all of these things. But I guarantee you the thing that, the, that our society will never do is preach the gospel and administer the sacraments and declare forgiveness of sins. You know why? That's our job. That's our only fucking job. That's it, right? So, 
so I, I mean, it's like, if you're doing that, like if you're in this church that, that a lot of the structural stuff or the numbers or the budget stuff or the staffing thing isn't what it was 20 years ago, if you're still preaching the gospel and administering the sacraments and declaring forgiveness of sins, you are successful at being the church. <laughs> I have a question for you that's um, a little more individual, not necessarily big church. I'm taking an alpha class right now, and our topic this week was um, resisting evil. And so there were some things that were said there that I was kind of curious about, and then I remembered what you said about you're 100% sinner and 100% saint at the same time. And so it kind of came down to at the end that resisting evil is submitting to God. And... Mm -hmm. Um, can you be submitted to God and living in sin at the same time? And then someone equated it to taking four steps forward and three steps back. Mm -hmm. And it didn't really sound that hopeful to me. So I'm just wondering, like, (laughs) okay, now I'm really confused, because where's the hope in that? So when when you're saying, I'm 100% sinner, I'm 100% saint, that really resonates with me, yeah. but taking three steps forward and two steps back doesn't. So I was just yeah. wondering if you could touch on, because we're talking about excellence yeah. and um, brokenness, about uh, is that grace? What is it that is saying, uh, how, do, how are you submitted to God and also a sinner at the same time? Oh, and how does that work? I'm s- so no, thank you uh, for answering. Gosh, no, I love that. I'm going to sit down while you oh, answer yeah, it. Yeah, because you're like, you take a while with me. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, some t- a lot of times in sort of more evangelical circles, sin is basically boiled down to immorality. And so um, basically you can avoid immorality, right? So if really you think sin is these sort of a list of things you shouldn't do, you can actually avoid doing those things. And so in that mindset, you're just walking in righteousness, you know, because you're, you're avoiding the, the no-nos on the list. Well, you know what? You are still a sinner. Right? You, can, you cannot commit these acts of immorality and you are 100% sinner. Because really, w- w- when, when our relationship with, to God is determined by um, how well we're doing with the list, with the no-no list, that's called, in Lutheran circles, living under the law. And there, w- when really you're living just under the law, there really are two options, pride or despair. That's it. You're either prideful of the fact that I'm the best at not doing the no-no list, or you despair in the fact that I can't manage to be perfect. Neither of those, as you said, is particularly hopeful. That's why we have this sort of intercession of God's grace that is transformative, that we don't don't manufacture it, we don't um, distribute it, we don't decide how much we get. It is just a fact that we're just immersed in all of the time. And so somebody asked me recently, I think it was in a more evangelical setting, they're like, hey Nadia, because here's the thing, I feel like God is, I'm not pursuing God. God's pursuing me all the time. I don't really do anything to pursue God. Someone said, what do you do personally to like get closer to God? And like before I knew what I was saying, I was like, what, nothing. Why would I do that? (laughs) That's like, what? I wish he'd leave me the hell alone half the time. Like, so. It's, a, it's this thing that pursues me. I, so I'm not concerned with like doing it right, getting it right. I mean, I try to be kind. I try to acknowledge when I'm wrong. I apologize to people. You know, I try to be a good person in the way that anybody would learn in Girl Scouts, right? But that's not, that's not religion to me. That's not spirituality. Hi. You know, this all sounded so much better in my head, so I'll give it a shot here. Um, you're going to do awesome. Huh? You're going to be awesome. Okay, thanks. First of all, um, like the woman that spoke earlier, I first was introduced to you through our own Krista Tippett yeah. on, on being. And you came into my life at a time, this, well, this whole past year has been very difficult mm. um, with being in a relationship with an alcoholic. Mm. And so I listen to you a lot um, with your t- Tuesday, the podcast that come out, and so many times you have given me so much back from what you have, your words. Thanks. And I guess my question would be, one, first I just want to say thank you for that, 
you have no idea how you have helped me survive this past year. Wow, thanks. Um, so my question would be, where do you find your words? How do you know what to say? Do you, do you meditate? Do you pray? Or does no. it just come? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking it probably just comes, right? I have to... So I do a lot of public speaking, and nobody has ever asked me that question. Thank you for that question. That's a really lovely question. Um, I have, I hate writing sermons so much. Like, I don't know how I'm gonna preach on Sunday. I don't know, I have nothing to say. I've spent hours reading the text. I'll read stuff online. I still don't have anything. I, um, and that's like a weekly sort of experience. And um, it's never easy. And I spend a lot of time and I always describe it, if you've heard me speak, you've heard this before, but I describe it as a wrestling match between me and the text. And I take my community into this wrestling match and then I don't walk away before demanding a blessing for them. And then when I do, I walk away limping. That's why, they're, that's why I, can't, I cannot preach every week. I can't do it, because my blood is in those things. So um, it feels costly. And I guess what I do is I just try and think, what's going on with me? Like, what am I struggling with? Or what's going on in my community? I spend a lot of time with my people, listening to them. I know what's going on in their lives. And I try to weave some sort of thing that, about me, some sort of need for the gospel within me, with, or the need for the gospel in my, the circumstances in my community, or like stuff in the world with that text as much as I possibly can. And um, it's hard. <laughs> Being a preacher is hard, I find. Um, and I clearly, I, I mean, it's obvious if you listen to them, they're really for those 200 people. I mean, I throw them up on the internet and I'm delighted they're meaningful for other people, <laughs> but it's really for them. I mean, being this, t these, these people's preacher is like a huge part of my identity in the world. And it's an honor that they let me do it. But I do it with fear and trepidation. I don't have confidence, I'm not an overly confident preacher. I, um, I'm actually fairly faithless. Like I think, I look at the text every week and I'm not kidding, I think, well, I've had a good run. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a joke, but I'm like, it's clearly over now, you know? <clears throat> I always try and keep like 20 minutes of Lectio Divina in my back pocket, just in case <laughs> nothing comes. But somehow, um, but somehow it's like being in the wilderness and like, it's, it's manna that's for other people, you know? It's like, it's like every morning I think, oh, I'm, not, I'm gonna wake up, it's not gonna be on the ground, and there it is. And it's there because God wants God's people to be fed. It's not there because I'm some sort of genius or I'm some sort of great preacher. It, I think it really is manna because God wants God's people to be fed. And um, I just rely on that, I think. Well, don't change, okay? <laughs> Are we done? No. Oh, no, okay. Oh, the last two. But he's been waiting patiently, but he just sat down because he was so tired. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, your church is full of people, just like my stepson, huh. who is very suspicious. Yeah. And I would really like to try to find a way to help him understand that religion is not the same thing as God. He sees yeah. religious people as hypocrites because they say one thing and they do something different. They don't live out their faith in a lot of ways. And what you're saying about the sinner and the saint is probably a lot of that. Yeah. But I wish, honestly, that your church was here so I could bring him to your church. <laughs> but I'm wondering if you have a way or a means of... Well, you know, the, 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 place, the place that we have where that is so clear that religion, God and religion are not the same are 12-step meetings. So does he, if, if he's lucky enough to have an addiction of some kind? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he, <clears throat> yeah. 
he doesn't have an addiction, but he probably and he probably doesn't have quite as many tattoos as you do. But I'm like, if I bring him your book and I show him the cover, would he read it? Yeah. Because I think he would feel like akin with you. Yeah. Because you look like him. I know, I know, <laughs> well, I, I mean, know. the tattoos. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I think people also get the impression that, um, you know, people with tattoos are dangerous or, you know. Oh, we're totally dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, we're all on our own path. I mean, I imagine there were a lot of people in my life during that decade that I sojourned outside of Christianity who felt the same. And I don't think that there was anything that they could have personally done to hasten my return to the church. So um, I wish I had some sort of advice for that, but I don't. There are some really great churches in the Twin Cities, though. You know, Humble Walk and Mercy Seat and House of Mercy, and you guys probably know some others, Solomon's Porch. So there's some really amazing communities here that, um, that he could totally check out. Okay, one over here, and then the guy who was tired. <laughs> I was intrigued by your comment about your worship planning group and the three people who've never been to an Ash Wednesday service that came to that planning group. Yeah. And my understanding is you did not come from liturgical tradition growing up either. What's your first experience of Ash Wednesday and how'd you react to it? Can you talk about that? Repeat the last... Can you rea- what's your first experience of Ash Wednesday? Yeah. And how was that? How'd you react to that? Um, I reacted very strongly to it actually because um, I was... We, uh, Matthew's internship parish <clears throat> was in Eugene, Oregon, um, United Lutheran. And I'd never experienced uh, Ash Wednesday before. And at the time, I was working at the HIV Alliance in Eugene, Oregon. It was a perfect job for me because we had this little cottage and I made two meals a day for people who had HIV. So anybody who was HIV positive in Eugene, Oregon could come to the Acorn Center and um, I would just be hanging out, chatting with them and making them food. It was, it was like an amazing job. But, um, but I was around a lot of death, more death than I'd been involved, you know, been around intimately before. And so to have the experience of these people who were, who were dying around me and to enter that space and it was really quiet and I just remember all of these people acknowledging their mortality in this, in this sacred space and I thought, you know, we live in such a death-denying culture, but death was around me, and so it was like this blessed relief to be in a space where at least it was acknowledged in some way. Um, Ash Wednesday this year was very intense. I did a funeral um, on Monday. There was this, um, you know, that Monday of Ash Wednesday was one of three days off in a month's time that I was going to get and I was just protecting it, and I got this call a few days before, and it was somebody, I never answer the phone if I don't know the, the number for obvious reasons, and I just talked to my doctor's office, and they were gonna call me right back, and that's who I assumed it was. It's very unusual for me to answer the phone if I didn't know the number, and this woman's like, oh, is this Nadia? And I thought, oh gosh, who is this? And, um, and she explained that her nephew had killed himself the day before, and that she got my number through, I do CrossFit, and I'm part of, that's my, that really is my community, um, my personal friend group, community, people I hang out with are, have nothing to do with the church, and she was part of another CrossFit gym, and she had asked another athlete, who do you think could do the service, and they said, you should get Nadia Bolzweber, so they called my coach, anyway, she got my number, and the whole time I'm thinking, no, no, I need that day, because they wanted the funeral to be Monday, right? I'm like, nope, I can't. I mean, I was just, in my mind, I just kept thinking, no, 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 you've got to have a day off. I was so tired. And so, <clears throat> and so finally she was like, look, he was, this, he was 29, and he was queer, and he um, was this amazing artist, and he was bipolar, and he struggled with drug and alcohol addiction. And, and then... Um, and I was like, I don't know, I really need, I, it's my day, you know, and I was struggling, and she goes, well, do you know of another pastor in town who could do it? And then I was like, and not fuck it up, no. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was like, I mean, because it was going to happen in the restaurant with all these hipsters and restaurant workers and no church people. And I, I mean, I love my colleagues, but that was really mine to do. And, um, and so, in a way that the funerals they do would not be, I'd be totally inappropriate, so... Um, and so I said yes, and so that Monday I, 
talked about Jesus and suffering and love and, and with all these people in this restaurant. And, and I was the person to, to say the thing at the time, it was clear. And it reminded me of why, what my actual calling is. Like my calling is to be able to preach the gospel in that kind of room. And so um, it was very dear. And then on Ash Wednesday, one of my parishioners had a baby. And so I went to the hospital and I put ashes on her family. And then this baby, like air had only touched this baby's skin for like three hours. <laughs> And I said, Willa too? And she said, yeah, Willa too. And I made the sign of the cross. And um, it was just, I, I don't know, like when you don't have those symbols and those, in that stuff to sort of lean into, to sort of define who we are and why we're here and our identity and all those things, I just, I can't imagine living without it. I can't imagine living without the Eucharist and singing the Kyrie again and singing the Psalms and like that stuff. The, I think the reason the people come to House for All Sinners and Saints is there's so much uncertainty and chaos in their lives, and like, but they come to how they come to church, and it's it's patterned and it's regular, and there's something trustworthy about it, and it's really deeply rooted, so they don't have to be cynical about it, and like they need it, like they need those signs. So I mean, I guess I'm here to say like people need this stuff. So even though we're cynical about the delivery method that, that the church has used for a long time doesn't mean that we don't want what the church has to give. And we can't conflate the delivery method with the stuff, right? So, you know, it's like there, were, there, were, there used to be um, phone booths dotting the landscape of America. They were everywhere, right? There were phone booths everywhere. And like, I defy you to tell me where a phone booth is now. So you can like, you can look at that data and go, wow, it's really sad that nobody cares about communicating with other people on phones anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and you could have a like, you can have like, a, you can hire me and go, to come and tell you how to redecorate your phone booth so that people will again care about talking on the phone, right? But redecorating the phone booth <coughs> isn't gonna work, right? The delivery method is different. Blockbuster, Charles Lee had this example of Blockbuster. You cannot fault Blockbuster for their business model. They were top of their game. That was one of the most successful businesses in, in the country for a long time. And so you can look at the fact that there are no more blockbuster stores and go, wow, it's just so sad that this generation doesn't care about watching movies in their home. <laughs> so while the delivery method is changing, it doesn't mean that the desire is any different or the need is any different. Okay, last question. No pressure. Yeah, right? <laughs> <coughs> Why? Oh <my> Whoa. <laughs> Why Olympic weightlifting? Oh, okay, I'm obsessed with Olympic style weightlifting. Do you guys know what that is? The clean and jerk and the snatch? Do you ever watch it on the Olympics? You guys know what it is? Oh yeah, you're a crossfitter. So it's, these t it's like such an obscure sport that nobody cares about, but I competed in the Rocky Mountain State Games and won the gold medal in my um, weight class and age group in Olympic style weightlifting this summer. Um, so, <laughs> I love Olympic style weightlifting because it's absolutely impossible to do. It takes like forever to learn and it seems so simple that you take a loaded barbell from the ground to overhead, but it's just, you have to use power and speed and strength and flexibility in half a second to be able to do it without you know, hurting yourself. So um, I love that question. Nobody else gives a shit though. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, you guys have been really great. I'm so grateful to be here. I love coming to the Twin Cities. It's one of my favorite places. Um, and you've been wonderful. And thanks to you guys for having me. preserving a tradition that saved my life 
and is so meaningful to all the people that I serve. If you guys had not faithfully kept this thing going, the people of House for All Sinners and Saints wouldn't have what's so life-giving to them right now. Thank you. And be I, I just want to say thank you for coming, and we do have a, a small gift I want to give to Nadia. I was driving her over here and explaining the flow, and I said we would give her something, and she said, I hope it's a toaster. Yeah. <laughs> As it happens, we are giving her that, but there, that's in my office. So in here, we're giving her a plaque that says, with thanks to Nadia Boltz-Weber for bringing faith to life. Thank you, thank you. so much. Thanks.